that gets my goat. Screw you guys. Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of That Gets My Goat on the Go. Can they even hear us? I think that they can. I can hear us. Oh, okay. But I'm sitting right here. I hear here. something vibrating over there and then I hear the car itself. Yeah. What was that movie where he's like, yeah, okay, I can hear you. Can you hear me? And he's like, of course I can. I'm sitting right next to you. They were like checking their, their uh, wire or something like that that they were going to use. Anyways, sorry. That's beside the point. So yeah, today we're going to try and do something that's a little... Uh, different than what we usually do. It's a it's a special episode. It's a lot different. We've never tried this, have we? I don't think on so. the air. I guess we've tried it in real life. Usually, I will talk and you just sit there. Yeah, I just I just lay there. Even I don't yeah. even sit there. <laughs> what we're doing today is we're gonna do basically a story idea pitch session. Not a pitch, but like working the story out together. We're going to see if we can create a story uh, together with each other here in the car while we drive the rest of the way home. So why don't you uh, introduce the, the germ of the idea to the folks? Okay, so, so basically, a strange thing happened to me, and it, I made it sound much stranger than it is, because that's my way. Uh, I have to embellish the stories, because nothing interesting ever happens my life but a, a stranger came up to me a little boy came up to me I, I mean I don't know if he's a little boy he was let's say that he was 10 came up to me and he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a little folded pieces of, of paper maybe something that he had done as an origami experiment and I don't know what it was supposed to be because it didn't look like anything. Maybe it was a toad or maybe it was a dragon or maybe it was a Klingon bird of prey, but I don't know what it was. But he set it in front of me and he said, you can have this if you want it. And then he walked away. Uh, now granted, again, I never met this kid before. This was not somebody that I had a relationship with or he was my cousin's firstborn or anything like that. I'd never met this kid before and he gave it to me and he said, you can have this if you want it. And then he left. And for a moment, I looked at it and I didn't want to pick it up. And I, now I don't know if it's because I figured this kid did origami using his own saliva to get the, the paper to bend or if there was, you know, some premonition of there was something wrong with this thing that he put in front of me. Of course, that's where my mind goes because that's the germ of the story. So the next day, you and I got together and we were in a store, we were in Target. And as we were walking toward the door, a little boy walked in, about a seven, eight year old little boy with blonde hair, and he started walking toward me. And for a moment there, I was sure that this little boy was going to reach into his pocket and pull some, out a piece of paper and say, you can have this if you want it. And you were going to be witness to this happening. <laughs> and that this was going to be the beginning of something that keeps happening to me with no explanation. And I thought, well, well how weird would that be? And I don't remember what your reaction was. I probably didn't wait for your reaction. I said, I've, this, we got to write this into a story. This has to be a story of what happens. And so since that day that the boy gave me the origami thing, oh, by the way, the seven-year-old, the, the Bond boy, he just kept walking. It turns out he was looking at somebody behind me, not me at all. So there's no truth to this story. But since that day, I've carried the little folded origami piece of paper in my pocket in my jacket pocket and uh, now it smells like cigarettes because we went to the Ellis Island Casino yeah. to do karaoke. There was some intense uh, cigarette smoke there. Now, we want to start by talking about the germ of this idea and, and seeing where we want to go with it for sure, right? Well, I think I've just given you the germ of the idea. Okay. I'm, I'm basically the story 
origin story by Guy, and now you and I are going to develop the entire sto- okay, story. Okay, now do we want to go so far as, do we want to decide now that, hey, this is something that happens again and again, is that the story? Or could it be something else? Like you said, you, you looked at that thing and you were afraid to open it, or sorry, you were afraid to touch it. You didn't want to pick it up. You set it on the counter next to you and you didn't want to pick it up. You know, there could be, like I was thinking today, what if, you know, you finally take this, you go home with it and you put it somewhere and then later on in that day you're walking and you get accosted by someone who tries to take this thing from you. So where is it? Where is it? And he knocks you down, searches through your clothes, goes through your pockets, holds you down and you don't have it. Like, he doesn't have it, you know, and then maybe you get home later and your whole uh, apartment or whatever, your house has been ransacked as they looked for this thing and it also wasn't there and you realize what this kid has given you is not just a folded up piece of paper and maybe you open it up, you unfold it or something like that and it turns out to be something much beyond that. Maybe it's uh, some kind of magical item or you know you open you unfold it and there's like a glowing thing in there that suddenly you inherit a power or I don't know what something like that would is that an option or do we want to stick with these children are bringing this thing to, and it's happening more than once and well let's let's stick with it happens more than once but all of your suggestion just now could still be part of the story. Okay. It's something that I'm not understanding, but clearly these children, if they're even children, do understand. It's part of a plan. It's part of something that that they are aware of. But again, you can go in any direction. Because when you said, okay, you unwrap the paper, I instantly, I thought, okay, there's a map. It's not just an origami toad. There's a map written on this. Or there's a magic spell that you, all I have to do is read it aloud and something will happen or you know or it's a message to me from somebody you know so only I can do something but I didn't bother to unwrap it for a couple of days uh, these are all possibilities and I don't know see I, I that's another thing the reason I wanted to do this as a that gets my go instead of just you and me sitting around talking about it is I don't know how collaboration is done for writers okay Writing to me is a very private masturbatory thing. You close the door and you turn off the light and you do it by yourself. Do you know what I mean? Uh huh. Because you, uh, with me, I, I'm accessing a part of my brain or a creative spark that's mine alone, and and it's uh, and there's a process for doing it, and everybody's process is different, and all that stuff. But when I hear that people developed a project side by side. I, I don't know how that's to be done, and so I wanted to see if we could do it live, if we could force inspiration. Okay. Well, I like, I so, really like the idea. But now, but wait, wait. Do you not like the second boy? No, I like the second boy. I'm thinking, though, if there is a second boy, then you're getting a collection of things, you know what I mean? If another person gives you another origami whatever it wouldn't be just a map maybe one of them could be a map and another one is another thing you need to do whatever it is you're doing but or maybe you know you're getting the various powers or something you know these these things could be some kind of trinkets that you know like a a green lantern kind of a ring thing where now you have this one and then you get another one now you have this thing and you put them all together and now you have the... Jeez, this road is terrible. Bouncing me in pieces. I need to get back into the other lane. It could still be a map. Right. And the second one is the next part of the map and you have to put three together or something like that. Right, right, yeah. Or it could be a spell and this is the second part of the spell. Or it it could be... uh, Let's say that there's just like a little piece of a a medallion or amulet And in the next one, there's another little piece of it, and you put them together, and you're closer to completing this thing. I don't know. But 
yeah, if it were a living thing or if it were a... And it could also be part of the message, the second part of the message. And like, by the time you read this, you will have already done the last... And he says, what? You know, he, he needs to go back and read the first. He never even realized that it was a message. Uh-huh. He, he just thought it was a, a toad thing. In fact, you could have him throw away the first one. Yuck. And when he gets the second one, he realizes that there was significance to the first one, and he has to go get it out of the garbage or he go try find to... it. And he may never be able to find it, and so he has to kind of proceed blind from part two, not having done part one. That's really good. I mean, we've seen that in stories. That totally works. Where you, for the story, you don't want the audience to have all the information, so you don't let the main character get all the information. I think you have to have at least three parts to the message for, you know, that weirdness to, to work. I mean, obviously it's really weird when a second person comes, but that can't be the last one. No, that doesn't have to be... You don't have to have three to make an inciting incident, though. You could keep having children show up with origami things throughout the length of the story that uh, this person gets. Is it stronger if it's a different child every time? Or if it's, no matter where he goes, it's the same child? I like the different child idea better. I think either one of them would work. They're both really weird. Uh, that it's weird that he keeps seeing the same child. But it's also very weird that there are different children. I don't know, I guess maybe... That depends on what, what we decide, we decide the thing is because, you know, obviously if there's different children, then it's like a network of things going on. Why are they children uh, that are giving him these things? Okay, well, the, it, how important is that I didn't want to pick it up? That, it, it seems like that is a very expendable part of the story. Especially if it's a very good thing that the kid has ended up giving me, you know what I mean? But if that's important, if that for a moment I was afraid to pick it up, then, I mean, this thing could be more dangerous or more suspicious or, you know, it could, it could be a tool that could be used for good or evil or, you know what I mean? I, right. Could, it could be something that's very, very momentous and life-altering. Um... At which would, you know, you, you're afraid to pick it up because something tells you that if you touch this thing, your life will never be the same again. You're not just going to ever just be, you know, Joe Blow who does whatever. You're, you're going to be launched into a, uh, you know, you don't realize that's why you're afraid to pick it up. But, you know, deep down inside, your subconscious knows, don't touch that thing unless you're ready for... Yeah, it could be a matrix, do you want the blue pill or the red pill sort of thing. Right. But if you choose to take the red pill, you, your life will never be the same. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Uh -huh. Where subconsciously he's like, or, or it could be that he at one point knew about what was going on. He knew that the rules of the world are greater uh, and now he's forgotten he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know that he's one of them. He's been brainwashed, whatever it might be. But subconsciously, he knows if you open that, if you take that thing, then you, there's no going back. That, that you are, your life will be very different. That you will have responsibility that you never had up to this point. I don't know. Again, I don't know if we're going about this the right way. Well, I think to plan this story out the, the number one thing that we have to decide we have our inciting incident we know guy gets the piece of paper he's afraid to touch it he thinks it's weird he either throws it out or holds on to it uh, and then suddenly a second child does that and now boom something is going on and he he but what we need to decide to make the story go from there is what is this thing? What is the deal behind these origami frogs or whatever? Once we've got that figured out, then we can plot a story from beginning to end. We can decide what this character is like 
you know, why they are children, and so on, so on, and so on. And maybe why they are children, it has something to do with, you know, what it is. Is it something, what do you think, what, what kind of ideas do you have for it? Is it something from a fantasy world? Is it an invisible kingdom kind of a thing where they're like, hey, you're the, the king and you need to wake up and realize this? Is it... It, it totally could be. I've purposely blocked off my b- creative part of my brain from focusing on it since it happened because I knew we were going to be doing this. Uh-huh. I, it's so easy for me to just start to dwell on it and start to think about it and decide, okay, it's going to be this. Um, uh-huh. But to do it with you, I didn't want to develop anything. Okay. But, but you know, like my instinct is, was, I'm going to say was because I'm not attached to it at all, that he had, that the boy had seen the main character do something or had heard somebody speak to him or, or, or something and decided he was the one. He's chosen this guy to be the bearer of this or to be, to pass the responsibility to. It could be that this first boy is an alien and he's dying. So he takes the form of a boy and hands this to the guy and then he dies and the guy never sees him again or realizes that. I mean, it's, that's kind of Abin Sur with the Green Lantern. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, he dies and he passes the ring on to Hal Jordan. But it could also be that this guy, the main guy, is one of them, but he doesn't know that he is from another place and these children are younger versions of him, not younger versions of him, but of his species or, or whatever it is. And so he was always destined. He was always intended to get this thing. He's merely forgotten. And maybe I can give a third option just for fun. Uh huh. Um, he's just a, an ordinary guy. Uh huh. And the kid has run out of time, or he's being pursued by sinister agents or whatever, and he just managed to slip away from them for a minute. And he puts this here, and the only thing he can think of to say, the only thing he has time to say is, you can have this if you want it. And he means to come back later and explain, you know, it's like, okay, what I gave you was very important. And I didn't have time to explain, but but he, he is killed, or he's whisked back to the prison from whence he escaped, or, or he has to keep running to get these guys away from the person that he's given it to. So that's our third option. And I'm sure we could come up with a fourth. If you want to come up with a fourth, do it. Yeah, I don't know. It's. I think it, uh, if we can decide or, I guess, throw out options for what the thing is that he's giving... That's the most important question. Is It, it might inform the, the other options around it. Okay. Like, is this thing a powerful object? Is it, you know, something where he... he, he you know, when he gets all of them and puts them together, you know, it puts together some kind of a puzzle, or is it going to be a world-altering kind of a thing, like the whole world, or is it just altering this guy? Is it from a fantasy land? Is it from an alien land? Well, what sounds like the most fun, let's just pretend that we have a deadline and we have to have this thing out. And so we can't dwell upon it for hours and hours and hours. We just have to have this dang story done by the right. time we get home. Uh-huh. Well, here's our three options, let's say. One is that they are aliens. And that this is like a, 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 a key or something for immense power. One is that they are from another dimension, a fantasy world or whatever. And this is a, a tool of also of immense power, but in a different way. And the third is this is supernatural stuff. And they may be angels or like sub demon kind of things, and this is for a spell or a curse or whatever. But in preparation for defending the earth from the sinister forces, or is that too much like fantasy? It's fantasy, but a different side of fantasy, so it's not too much like it. Okay, and so let's say sci-fi, fantasy, or horror. It's one of these three. Let's pick one of these three which is, that genre is going to inform what this thing is. Okay. Which do you like more? Horror? Well, you know I like horror <laughs> most, but horror can go hand in hand with fantasy, and horror can go hand in hand with science fiction, but not right. so much. No, I think they go hand in hand in, in both cases. Uh, an army of aliens 
uh, like Signs, for example, that was a horror film. It was. Despite the fact that they were aliens, that was a horror film, not a sci-fi film. Yeah, I, I think I might be willing to lean uh, toward fantasy. Okay. With horror in it. All right, that's fine. Arbitrarily, that is now our z- genre. Okay. It is a fantasy story, but we're going to try and put some kind of horror element to explain that the he didn't want to touch it. Sure, that works for me. All right, so portal between worlds, uh, uh, an object of immense magical power. The the end is coming. Not a biblical end, but maybe a you know a prophesied the end that you know there will be a day when the old ones reawaken. Uh, that's a possibility. It could even be something is coming that none of us are capable of destroying or, or protecting our world from. Uh, but, but this guy, if he's given whatever it is, will be able to be our champion, to be our defender. I don't know. The, these creatures may work for the malevolent force, and they've decided to jump to the other side and say, I don't want this world to be destroyed. Uh huh. Let's find somebody that can do what we can't do. Because the master will surely destroy us once he finds out that we, you know, we have taken this. Yeah, I, I like that idea. The idea that I originally had, and I know that this, I'm not exactly sure how it would work, but I was thinking that when he finally does open the frog origami thing up, inside it's just a, a like a ball of light. It's just like a, a light thing. He, and, and he won't know what to do with it. I would guess. That might be the thing. He gets all these things and uh, he doesn't know how to use them. And maybe it doesn't have to be a ball of light, but I, that seems like... But you like that visual. I do like the visual. Okay, That's well, the visual I see is him opening like it up that. and then all of a sudden light shines in his face. And it's just a light. It doesn't have a handle. It doesn't. It's not in something. It's just a light, but he can grab it and he can stick it in his pocket. And then his pocket kind of glows. Okay. And and all of them will have that? Or the first one will have that and the others will have instructions as to what to do with the light? Uh, I was thinking that they would all have it. Okay. And like each one is further strength or further power. Something necessary. Like what is coming? You know, the idea I, I think of like maybe the end of Cabin in the Woods when the giant god thing blasts out of its prison and is now going to just destroy all of humanity uh, now that it's free would, would it be something like that that this you know person is now he's, he's got to be ready to defend is it a horde of demons a horde of dragons a horde of vampires a horde of some kind of horde <laughs> uh, any of that would work. Should all, we should decide if the whole world is being threatened, or maybe this just this guy's little town is going to be wiped off the face of the earth, and the things will move on from there. But if they can nip it in the bud here in this one little town, before this thing becomes too powerful, you could actually stop it or put it back to sleep or kill it. But I don't know. I mean, just the idea that one ordinary person could defend the world from Yog Sagoth or something like that is hard for me. You know what I mean? It's like, right. well, how? How would somebody... Because that thing at the end of Cabin in the Woods was mountain-sized. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, I don't know if you've ever... If you remember or if you ever saw this show, there was a show that I used to watch when I was a child called Ultraman where this guy was a small guy but he had like this little thing and every time a giant monster would attack Japan he would bust out this thing and he would use it and he would grow to giant size and he was able to fight these monsters and stop them from destroying things and perhaps this ball of light or whatever we decide to make it be could be that thing where he uses this and now or he uses all of them once he gets them all and they give him you know the size the strength the 
powers to be able to take on this uh, threat. It, it, it would be interesting. I think, I mean, I like the idea that it's not the whole world that he's trying to save. Uh-huh. That perhaps the whole world could be in danger if he doesn't stop it. Uh, you know, like, it's it's happening first in a small town, and maybe this evil god or whatever harvests the souls of these people, gains energy from them, like the life force, the, the naked lady from life force would suck the life force out of people, and but in doing this becomes more powerful, and maybe it starts as a small you know, a human-sized thing, but the more people it attacks and destroys, the more powerful it becomes, and by the time it's emptied this town, it will be able to do serious damage and go on to somewhere like San Francisco or something and, and, and tear it apart. So it needs to be stopped from the beginning. I think that's cool. I don't know. What do you think? No, no, I think that that is cool, and it's already given me the ending for the story, <laughs> which is, let's just pretend that we decided that this thing is going to be a worm. You know, something that's like a worm that's been sleeping way, way down in the ground, and now it comes out and it wants to eat Bozeman, Montana. And this and guy... friends in Bozeman. Yeah, this guy has been the cho chosen, or at random, or by destiny, whatever, to protect the town from this worm. The worm is the size of a Winnebago. And he, using these balls or whatever, manages to defeat this thing, even though it's it's difficult. And then at the end of the story, like there's a hundred more kids that come to him, each with a ball, to let you know, dude, there's going to be so many more of these worms. I like that for the ending of it is a small scale victory but it's but the, the work has just begun I what do what do you think of that ending I do like that ending um, worms but they don't have to be worms they can be any they can be giant mosquitoes or they can be they can be beautiful naked ladies they only look like naked ladies and they're just here to destroy the world or whatever but who would ever want to harm a naked lady yeah or they could be they could look like rocks. They could be spirits, that kind of things, you know? They could be evil ghosts type, type things, or they could be insects, or they could be... They could look like children. And these things that escaped were good versions of those. Um, or, or, you know, it could be a traditional giant monster. Dang it. It's okay. It didn't break this time. I see light on the floor, but not in my pantaloons. Well, if they are going to appear as children, then somehow they have to know about this thing. So either they're from some kind of a secret society, or perhaps, uh, you know, the idea that you had where they're turncoats against this evil and they want to stop it, and so they've, they've become traitors and they're handing out the power or something like that uh, to this guy. Well, do you like the idea that each one of these balls is the life essence of a human being or the life essence of whatever there were before human beings or something like that? And Perhaps. if you consume this or if you uh, somehow connect with this ball of light, that you gain that ability or that power or that the extra... Energy. Yeah. I like that idea. You know, that just gave me the idea that what if when these children come and they say you can have this and they give it to them it's their own essence that's, that's right. inside the frog and when he opens it this. that child dies yeah when he takes that essence into himself the child is done but I would I think that our bad guy if these people are coming they they and they're appearing as children I don't think they're really children is what I feel anyways Okay, why would they choose to look like children, do you think? If, if they aren't really children. Oh, and, and, you know, you don't have to have an answer for that. I, I, it's maybe some... Children some... are harmless. Children can walk among people in a grocery store and not be 
whereas what these things really are and but they're harmless so the guy would not be afraid to take something from them okay would not worry about being approached by them it's not like some big dude walks up to them Okay, so you but, can have this if you want to. Yeah, that's very different. <laughs> and also, yeah, if they're horribly ugly monsters, no one would talk to them. No one would take anything that they had. Uh, but you know, kind of like the Gozer at the end of Ghostbusters, she chose chooses to look like some Sheena Easton-looking European model. It could be that yeah, they've chosen something that they think will be the most easily accepted as a force for good or something, right? Uh-huh. But then what does Gozer, what does the act the evil one choose? Does he also choose a little kid form? Because, I mean, that's appealing to me because of my fear of children and because we're not actually making this into a movie. But Here's the maybe Sheena, he Sheena appears, Houston. maybe he appears in his own form and it's just terrifying and these little ch children things would look like that too, but they've chosen not to because they don't want people to be afraid. Yeah, I think that these children things have to be much lesser than the big baddie. Um, they can be similar, maybe uh, like a cat compared to a lion uh, kind of things. Or they can be, uh, you know, opposite species or something. You know, like a cat versus a dog. This giant lion is going to come and destroy it. And these little dogs are like, oh no, we need to stop it. And we're dogs, so we oppose cats. Wait, wait, what? What? Yeah, you know, it's it's like they're opposite species that are in forever in conflict. Well, what's the opposite of a child? An old person? Well, no, no, the opposite of the child. I'm, I'm talking the... They can both appear as children, but what is underneath, is, I think, should be different in the end. And they can both be gruesome, but the children are harmless versions of, you know, a lesser, much lesser version of the, the actual threat. Perhaps they're subjugated by the threat or something like that. Do you get what I'm saying? Sure. Okay, so yes, these are the servants or the grandchildren or, or something of the, the main villain, of the power, of the darkness. Uh-huh. Um, and so they are what he is, but much lesser versions of that. Much less powerful, much less long-lived, or what, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and also much less bent on murder or world domination or whatever it is that his plan is. But they're still creepy scary. They're like, I don't know, little gremlins as compared to a gigantic gremlin. And so, yeah, they choose to appear. And they, I, I, I suppose, how do they choose to appear? Are they scientifically advanced? So they use some kind of holograph? kind of a thing to hide their their we decided fantasy huh I think so it's I suppose just... they use some sort of a spell or a... well why don't we say that they're shapeshifters that they actually became children and then once they become children they become vulnerable like children I, I don't know maybe that doesn't work but it's just like they, they can change their form to this and the, the the big daddy thing can also change his form unless you don't like that, unless it's just, it's an illusion that they're not horrible, that they cast so that we don't quail in fear. Yeah, I like the illusion more than the shape-shifting thing. All right. Just they, they have some kind of a, a spell or a, a, you know, they, they put on a cloak or something that changes what they look like so that the uh, human is not afraid. I, I really like the idea of him having these things and then maybe the the bad thing starts appearing around town. Is there more than one bad thing? Or is or are there minions of the bad thing like these traitors that are working for him that he has to deal with? I, just for simplification's sake, there's one bad guy 
at this moment, and he is a an advanced scout kind of thing. And these children have awakened before he did, because he is their master, and they have to prepare things for him and, and all that stuff. And maybe in preparing, they saw life on Earth or whatever, and they're like, hey, no, this, this, this shouldn't be destroyed. But I don't know. We've all seen that a bunch of times, but it resonates because we'd all like to think that if other species came here, they were just like, oh, hey, let's, we were planning to destroy you, but we don't want to now because you guys are, are noble or you guys are beautiful or you guys have art or humor or something that we don't have. Boobs. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think of that? I do like that. Do you like that they are his, his sort of his uh, handmaidens or whatever, these children things? And maybe they've just grown sick of being his servant and they've just plotted for a long time. If we ever had a chance to break away, it would be worth even our lives because this guy sucks and he abuses us and he, there's no positive to working for this guy. And so either they say, well, you know, we can make a human a champion to fight him or we can fight him ourselves. But because we're subservient to him or because we're his descendants or whatever, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Because there is servants. He can just snap his fingers and we would be forced to kill for him yeah. or we would be forced to kill ourselves. He owns them and they can't fight him. But if they can give their power away, it, kind of, it makes me think a little of uh, Galactus and he has... The Herald? Yeah, the Herald guy or guys that go and they go from place to place and they destroy worlds and eat them and whatever. Yeah, finally these the heralds have busted free from his control enough or maybe it's just because he sleeps and they've had enough that they're going to uh, stop him. I think they should go from dimension to dimension feeding off the life force of what they find. And normally... You know, they don't find intelligent species or something. They're not species that are self-aware. You know, they're just lower life forms that scrabble along like dogs and cats and, and whatnot. That haven't evolved to the point where they are uh, conscious like that. And they see, you know, what they see in people and they realize that it just can't, that can't be done here. They don't want anyone else to be subject to the horrors that they have been subject to. So they decide to free them, or to give them a chance anyways, to fight against him. Okay, so these things came forth out of some kind of portal. Early, before he... Because he's on the way, or just because he's sleeping, and he doesn't like to do the dirty work himself. He just wants to eat. He doesn't want the, the meat to cook the meal. Let's say that... They have to do something to bring him forward. Like, he's so much greater or something that they have to come and they have to set it up so that his portal is, you know, they can easily make one portal that's small, but they have to set up the spell that makes a giant portal that this thing can come through. Or you were saying before, you have something that has slept. Do you like that? I, I like it, but... It's just, it's mostly because you mentioned Captain in the Woods. And in that, yeah, those things slept. And as a lullaby, you had to give them a human sacrifice, a, a very A, B, C human sacrifice. Yeah. Well, if um, these things are the minions of it, I would guess that they would have to keep... Well, let's say that there are a hundred for... of these things that have all entered into little tiny portals... And it's their job to open up like, the huge portal for him to come out. And there's two or three of them that broke off and said, no, we're not going to do it. While the others are all building the portal right now. So there's only a matter of a few hours before this portal opens. And these few that have rebelled know that they will be killed for this. And that there's no way to stop it from coming through. But it's like, well, maybe we can do something about it by the time it comes through. I you does like that, that? Does that eliminate your ending that you had planned? Where all the other children come and give him... So you know that there's more of these things to come? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, it sounded like we switched from that this is just some destructive monster to that this is a being of malevolent intelligence or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. It went from Gamera to Galactus, but I guess we could backtrack if you don't want it to be Galactus. I didn't want to change the idea to Galactus per se. Um, I just figured that these children that come need to be something, you know, that that goes along with this thing. And, you know, Gamera has that uh, get things prepared for them and some of these minions split off. That's why I was thinking that there should be evil, the evil minions, like you were saying, you know, there's the three or four or however many that have split off. And uh, there is... uh, the rest of them that haven't split off and maybe they try, they find out what these others have done and they're also trying to get him to keep him from being able to take on their master there maybe these things are like monks or acolytes or whatever that worship this thing and so they prepare the way for it, even though it's nothing but a mindless, destroying machine uh, or beast, but they're kind of like the, the monks that lead it places, and it somehow blesses them with, you know, power or happiness or whatever. Maybe as it destroys, it puts out this orgasmic kind of energy that they, you know, that they live for. Well, I mean, it could just be as simple as they get the crumbs. They get what's left once he's done gorging himself and he goes back to sleep. And these five acolytes are just tired of it. The crumbs are never going to be enough. And and I, I, I don't know. I, I like the idea that they are intelligent beings, these and the things that look like children. Uh-huh. And that they're, they're basically good. But if we saw how ugly they were, we would it immediately assume they were evil. I like that. Uh-huh. But it could be that they are very low on the totem pole and they're more powerful versions of the Acolytes and they just get eliminated by the, the ones that actually obey. Um, and that's why it's up to our hero to, to do all this himself is because these things are weak and little and so easily destroyed either by their own kind or by us. But once this thing comes through, it's like that to us. We are easily destroyed by it. I'm starting to think more that it needs to be a giant worm again. Oh, you like the worm? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be a worm. Well, you and I could come up with like three different things crossed that it looks like. Like, it's got a centipede body and it's got... Kate from Lost's head, and it's got a squid. Do they uh, squids have beaks? I think so. And tentacles, and at least they do in the cartoons. I don't know. I, I just I like the idea that it's just something that we immediately on seeing it we would be revolted by it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because it's just, there are certain things that live on Earth that we just go Ugh, when we see because of their shape or be we talked about it when we did the wasp episode or the you know whatever thing cockroach if it were a cockroach mixed with a mollusk mixed with a wasp mixed with a jellyfish but just like all the ugliest aspects of those things uh-huh. so mostly cockroach cockroach uh, cluster it would uh, instinctually we're just terrified of it or revolted by it, and the fact that it's large makes us terrified of it. But I don't know. I, I like the giant worm. I, I don't think that the smaller things should also be worms. They should be more acolyte things. I, I like that idea as well. Or, well, or, it could be the like the queen ant, and these are all the servant ants. I'm not saying that they are ants, but it's that sort of society. Uh, the uh, the queen tends to ex- tends to be. You know, the one that they all bring the food to, and she's the one that lays eggs, and she's sedentary, and and all these other ones are the the fighters and the workers and the 
I don't know if a, a queen ant is even smart. I think it's the, the soldier ants that are smart. I don't know. From what I've seen, and at least in science fiction books, the queen ant is like, or the hive is all one mind that the queen controls. They don't even think for themselves. But yeah, okay. I, I prefer but the how way did... that you're talking about it, where this thing is not smart. It's just a. It just loves to rape. Yeah, it's just. That's all it does is rape and. Gorging machine. It'll go out and it will just eat every living thing and it will suck the life force out of them and yeah these these worker ants get the crumbs and all this time you know it's such an amazing thing the wonderful orgasmic energy that they feel when they get these crumbs that many of them are willing to do whatever it takes to get it um, almost like it, I, I like the the acolytes like it's kind of a religion and this thing is their god that they're serving like thing but yeah these are these guys aren't worms they're more like little ETs or something like that that we would think oh my gosh they're so hideous um, and some of them are they just are evil things and then some of them are not they're just they you know they've Understood. They've come to realize that what they do is wrong, and they can't do this now to the population of Earth. They've come to now. So is they, it the population of Earth, or is it the population of Bozeman, Montana? Well, it's the population of Bozeman, Montana, but we know that if this thing gets the life force from the people of Bozeman, Montana, it will be able to rage on beyond the borders of Bozeman. All the way to Billings. Oh! And on to Fargo. And beyond. And then the world. So, you know, each place it goes, it will only get worse. And eventually it will suck the world dry. Okay. This is the Let's beginning say... of the end. And the end will be a long process, but the end will come. I like that. Let's say that... This is the first planet that they've come to, or dimension, or whatever, where there's just like billions of souls. In the past, it's all been, there are parasites here, or there are plants here, or that. this one has dinosaurs, or whatever. But this is a place that it's been looking for since they started this journey. This is home for this thing, because it'll be able to gorge forever. You know what I mean? It's like, this is, this is Shangri-La for the worm. And I think it would be cool that there's no way that a human being could fight it. Not, you know, the, the whatever it is, whatever the being is, it can't be fought except for, you know, if it has the stuff that's in, you know, the life force that's in the, uh, the frogs, the, the origamis. That's the only thing, a gun will not harm it. A jet could drop a bomb on it, and it will not harm it. It's somehow <clears throat> spectral or of a different nature than, you know, a regular... You couldn't take a sword to it and cut it open unless you had a life force sword or something. Okay, that's that's fine. Now, see, I was thinking more along the lines of we could shoot it with a tank or whatever, but the second we get near, it sucks out our life force, and we're gone. We're dead because that's what it does. That's all it does. Um, and so maybe you could nuke Billings, Montana, or it's not Billings, it's Bozeman. Bozeman, yeah. Um, and kill this thing. But I, I just, I like the idea of once it emerges, it's just sucking people right and left. And, it, you know, it's the people are running and screaming, but you can't get away. It's already here. And, uh, yeah, the he is just a man... But with whatever they've given him, he it can can't suck his life it. force. Yeah. And it can, he can pick up a flamethrower, I guess, if he wants, and burn it. I, I don't know, though. I mean, how. I, I like the idea, though, that it because it's not from here, it's not organic in the same way that a real giant worm would be or whatever. And if you hit it with a, a machete, it's not going to do any. Yeah, see, I was thinking, you know, when, when you said, hey, this thing, now that it's out, it can gorge forever, 
if we could nuke it, it can't gorge forever. But if it could crawl into the middle of New York City and then just gorge and gorge and there's nothing you can do to get rid of it, then it can gorge forever and it's, you know, a really serious threat. You know, if it's made of something that can't be harmed by our physical weapons and it must be some other kind of weapon, such as the things that they, that he gets in his frogs. Okay, hey, th- uh, this origami thing is the shape that they actually are. Okay. And that and when, so when he first looks at it, he's revolted, but he's but he doesn't know why, and that's what these children actually look like. Is, it, is that do you do you like that? I do, sure. And it contains their essence within it. And I was thinking, you know, the start of the story would be interesting if you have the guys going about his, you know, business before the call to action and uh, yet these things are there in the background it's, I'm thinking of this as a movie unfortunately which it's not going to be no but it's going to be an audio drama eventually and I cannot wait to hear your daughter say and an orgasmic flow of energy permeates each one of us whenever the master feeds <laughs> yes the main character will have to enjoy the orgasmic flow of energy when he uh, takes the life force too. And he came in his pants again and again. Yeah, but see, then we're going into the the area of well, he could just rule the world once this is over, then, and he can just like orgasmically suck the uh, the life from anybody who stands against him or whatever. I like the idea that that this stuff is wholly alien that it that you know it's like he can't only their arthropodic species can suck the life from uh, oh yeah no i wasn't saying he was sucking the life he is given it and internalizes it and it gives him the power to be or makes him like them enough that he's able to do battle with the worm okay so but it's also a temporary thing like that's why the worm has to keep coming out and feeding. It can't just sit still and die. It's like food, basically. And you get the energy to be able to, you know, do whatever you're going to do, but eventually it'll wear off. And this guy can't, you know, suck life out of things like the other thing can. So he can't rule the world. He, he only has enough. Uh, and these he can't take it from them, but they can give it to him. Of their own free will. Right. Even. They can, oh, I like they know that. how to, you know, remove it from themselves and offer it to him. But he can't take it from them, whereas the worm could. Um, and it does to the people of the world. Of Bozeman, sorry. I, I, I think that this, I, and I'm seeing it as a film as well. <laughs> That's just And I'm really me, enjoying seeing the final confrontation and seeing this thing emerge, you know, this horrible, horrible thing. We're just going to keep calling it the worm because that's essentially what it is, you know, something that burrows in the ground and then comes out. But uh, we can have it just be covered with eyes or have millions of stingers or, you know, whatever it is and not actually be a worm. I just like, there's something so visceral about a, a slug or a a worm or a caterpillar, you know what I mean? Because viscera are basically the same shape, probably. (laughs) Okay, so these are the life forces of these drones? Yeah, I think Or this is the crumbs, this is the stuff that they have been able to hoard from themselves from the other times he's, he's consumed. I think that they're their own life forces. I think the crumbs that they are, are like food to them, too. And they live off of it, and it, you know, so they can't hoard them or whatever. Okay, and because he is human and not one of their species, the worm can't just snap his fingers and they will die, or snap his fingers and they will obey. Only one of us can be the champion in this case. Right. That's why they've chosen this person. 
right? Uh, rather than trying to do it themselves. Mm-hmm. And, uh... So, do you eat it? And if so, that's fine. I like the idea of he just puts it in it, he just consumes it. He either sniffs it up or he inhales it or he, he actually has to swallow it. Yeah. I, I, I don't know that it works as a suppository so much, but... <laughs> I think eating it was my idea that I had for it, but it's a ball of light, so he never considers doing something like that for a long time, you know. Until... But you could just squeeze it in your hand and absorb it into your skin. I mean, th that's something he could discover at the end when there's like 206 of these balls of light left and there's no way he can fight the creature by himself. Is it, I can just grab them and absorb them because their energy, they're not actually food. Sure, but our skin doesn't necessarily let things be absorbed. Um, generally, the way we take something in is by way of eating. And But it, since it's a ball of light, it's not like food where it would fill you up. You could take all of them, stick them in at once if you've got 206 of them or whatever. Okay, I'm just, again, visually trying to imagine a guy with a ball in his hand and he squeezes it and it just goes into his cells. Uh -huh. He recharges his cells or whatever it is, you know, the same way that, you know, you could squeeze poison into your skin or you could, you know, sunlight yeah. is absorbed into your skin or ink, you know. I, uh huh. He could inhale it. Yeah, I thought about just that, but then it, became, then it became too much like cocaine. But if well, you inhale it in your mouth, it, right? yeah, you breathe it instead of snorting it. But yeah, I, I I like the idea of the. I was just thinking of this, you know, the guys going about his daily business, and there's the children in the background behind him. He doesn't see them, but they're like watching him, and they're watching people, and somebody is doing origami, like a little child has an origami book and they see them folding paper, and then they see him making those little, the origami things that you make where you open and they have stuff written on them, you know? We say, pick a number, and then you go one, two, three, four, you know, kind of a thing, where they like have something inside. Or maybe they could see, I guess, the origami box that you open up and there's another origami box inside of it or something. And that's how they, come up with this plan of giving him origami frogs with their or sorry, origami alien or origami acolytes <laughs> I don't know what we're calling them but yeah, beings with their thing inside and so we, they see them doing uh, origami and they, they use that and these children kind of in the background and there's scary drone playing every time they are noticed back there or do we want what? that at all do we want that not to be apparent yeah, until I, later and we want the first time the child comes as a film we don't want to explain anything at the very beginning but you can certainly have children observing other children with origami and they get an idea from it without the audience knowing that these aren't really children and you know what I mean right you put two and two together that, oh, okay, so they were observing actual humans, but they're acolytes that only look like human. Uh, anyway, but are the evil acolytes, the ones that are preparing the way, are they also looking, taking on children form? Are they, are they, are there lots of them in Bozeman right now? The loyal ones need to be on the tail of the traitors. There needs to be some trying to get them. And that's why, you know, they just kind of sneak in, give him his frog, and then he doesn't see them anymore. They disappear. You know, it's like you were saying when we first started, where they're like, oh, I only have so much time and I can only give you this to you quick. And then I've got to run to get away from the others that are after me. Because, see, it would be really easy if one of these acolytes said, we only appear to be human, we're not human, we come here before the master comes. Once the master comes, you're effed. And here's everything that you need to know. But it, in stories like this, it works better for storytelling if he has to learn it on his own. And only later he can find out, oh, okay, you're not really children. Or, oh, okay, the master is coming. You know, no. So do the children 
die. They're, they're sacrificing themselves by giving him the, this life force. Or are they killed by the loyal acolytes? Or do they run and they're moving on and hopefully they will catch up with him later to be able to explain why they gave it to him? Yeah, I think that they run and they're hoping to catch up. And I even think that it might be cool that that is what happens in the end. That the worm has appeared now and these children come to him and they say, you know, you, you have stuff, use it. And, and he realizes that he needs to use these to fight the thing and they're there. And when he ingests their life force, they die in front of him. They say, you know, their their life is snuffed out, and he sacri- they're sacrificed so that he can fight them. I see the scene where the children that have given him the frogs come back out around him. And, uh, but he doesn't. At this point, he doesn't realize that once he consumes these balls, they're dead. Right. I like that idea. I, I want him to consume one by accident early on, but he never makes the connection that that acolyte that gave him the ball doesn't show up again. Uh-huh. Um, and it's not until the end when, you know, all is made clear that he realizes that when I consume all this stuff, they will all die. Yeah, you can have them consume one and, they, and it dies. Uh, you know, and the others are like, go. He's like, but, 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 he just died when I did that. Like, no, we, we sacrifice ourselves. Like, we're dead anyway, once the master wakes up. So, we are willingly sacrificing ourselves to save all of the people of this world. If you don't do this, then it's all wasted, yeah. Okay, so what happens when he eats one, or when he takes it into his hand, or rectally. The suppository. Yeah, what what happens? I think that, that is cool. He does it by accident, and he gets this power, and maybe all the cars explode around him. No. Like, <laughs> and little cartoon demon heads fly around him. But now he has some power, so the bad uh, acolytes that are chasing after now him, I guess, because at some point they're going to be pursuing him instead of the decoy, the dummy ones that dumped their uh, life force and ran away. You know, they'll discover what they have done and they'll come after him and he'll be able to defend himself with the power that he has now against them. I would think, although he doesn't know how to control it or what to do with it. What is the power? Is it just strength? Is it the power to energy project? Is it power to suck energy out of things and gain strength from that? Uh, I don't think it should be that, because that's what he's fighting against. Does it just open his eyes and he's able to see things as they really are and see all the signs in the heavens or whatever pointing to the countdown and that you, you know, look on the town square and three of the children are no longer children. They're these horrible wasp-looking things. Or... I like do you that. want it to he be actual his... power? I do think it should be power, both energy and, uh, you know, ability, uh, strength, but also some kind of, you know, like a spirit energy that he can fight the worm with. You know, he can make a giant sword that can do damage to this worm out of the energy. Oh, okay. So if he just, like, pulls a stop sign up out of the ground and starts beating on the monster with it because he's become super strong, that wouldn't work? Right. A stop sign won't hurt this thing. Because this thing is made of different kinds of stuff. Yeah, elements that we don't have. Yeah. Yeah. It's spectral or whatever. And so you can't harm it with physical objects. You need the power, the the life force that he's given to, to battle with it. Okay, so he absorbs the first one by accident, and it opens up his eyes that, hey, things aren't, things are, this isn't right, this isn't real, these are, I don't know what it is, maybe just like in the sky, in the distance, you can see the hole starting to open. Because it's, I like the idea of the ground being, you know, where it is sleeping, but let's think fourth dimensionally, it's, for us, it's in the sky. 
it's a whole opening to another uh, dimension, not just to another place down in the ground. And he can see them, the things, working on opening this hole, right? Yeah, and he can see the, like you were saying, where, you know, he looks across the town square, and now suddenly he can see through their little disguise. They're not children or naked ladies or whatever it is that's coming after him now. They these, are... These things are in the town somehow harvesting energy or, or doing something they're in to help of... open the, the portal. So there, there are two or three of the evil ones in the town at any given time. Well, I was thinking they're but in the pursuit rest are of all the bad guys. On, oh, okay. I guess the that's ones fine. that are in the town are the ones that are in pursuit of the traitors slash our hero. And so, yeah, I mean, when he does it by accident, it might be, you know, uh, it, it would be interesting if you know these, the ones you know, they've captured the traitors, they've interrogated them, tortured them until they know what they've done and now they're you know, ten feet away from being able to just kill him and he accidentally ingests this thing and suddenly he sees that they're bearing down on him and uh, he's involved in a fight scene and they fight that's that's what I've written in the script I, I just wrote they fight sometimes and um we're going to go from there. Okay, so I still don't understand how the power works. I understand, obviously, the power of opening your eyes to what's really going on. And I, I like that. I, I even like the idea that there are maybe really sexy girls approaching him, and he accidentally opened, uh, absorbs this thing, and then the veil is lifted. And they're not sexy girls at all. They're horrible things, and they see him as an enemy. But maybe that could be the second one. The second thing that he observe, absorbs, but the first is to say, "Okay, things are not as they seem," and then he gains some kind of ability. And I'm still, in my mind, I, I don't understand what the ability is. I mean, if it's just strength, that's easy. Anybody can understand that suddenly he's the strongest two men instead of just as mm -hmm. one. And you know, the more of these he absorbs, the stronger you will become. That's easy because it's. You know, it's something that we could uh, quantify. But when you said, you know, that he's able to make energy weapons, I yeah, I don't that, know what that is. He has like a the power to do battle with these spectral things, so he has like the spectral energy, so he can fight them. You know, in that way he has that power. So yeah, he can imagine a sword that's made out of light and the sword will appear in his hand and then he can use that sword to cut one of these alien things in half and kill it. And does he get its its life when he does that? Or no. Does the what the happens life, to the life? The life just goes like anyone else when they die. The 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 power has to be given to him from the bad guys or the good guys. This guy doesn't have life-sucking powers like the bad guy does. Well, I like the idea that he has something enormous when he first gains this power. Like, like a huge erection? Like a giant sickle or, or, or scythe or something like that. That's how big his sword is. But as the power yeah, starts to did. wane, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh -huh. Even though it's not... It, even though it's made of energy or whatever, you know right, what I mean? Yeah. But it's just like, uh, before I could have taken on a bunch of these things, and now all I have is like a dagger left, and the others are like, well, it's because the energy you absorbed from us, is it's, it's gone. It's almost, you've used it all up. Yeah. And uh, It wears out over time. And it's so, just like the energy you get from eating a dinner. At the end, when he has to fight this thing, by absorbing several energies from several of these acolytes, he would be able to make, you know, just a, yeah. like a huge dueling, uh, whatever the, the jousting pole oh, is lance. called, a lance and a shield and a, a whip and all whatever he wanted to because it's huge and it's powerful. But the, the worm can just try to start sucking that away from him. And so he's got a very limited amount of time to kill the worm. Uh-huh. 
I don't know. I, I just I like the idea of it getting smaller and smaller. If he's creating a an, an energy weapon. Uh huh. I like it too. Yeah, I think it fits with what we've talked about already, especially. And yeah, let's. I I don't think the guy should have genitals at all. Okay, okay. I don't know how that fits with what we've talked about so far, but oh no, just when I said, well, so when he gets this thing, he has a huge. And you're like, <laughs> yes, erection. Uh, I, but I don't know. I like that. Be, obviously, going hand in hand with 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 genitals. Um, if there's somebody in the town that he's attracted to, you, there's somebody to fight for, and there's also somebody to try and impress with your abilities. Uh huh. But I don't know if we want to go that way. If this is the kind of person who. Once his eyes are opened and he realizes everyone in Bozeman is screwed unless he acts, then maybe there's not room for selfishness or not room for, oh, well, I can get even with the people that were uncool to me now that I have this ability. Or I mean, all that kind of stuff is fun, but it doesn't have to be in this story. Yeah, I don't see this story as being something like Zapped. But I do he has a want... power and so he goes out and uses telekinetic ability to rip women's shirts open. But I like that too. I but like I that do too, but I don't see that in this story. The people being killed right and left by either the acolytes or by the worm once it arrives, that it, it's we're just that helpless to it. Yeah. I, I and so, uh, you know what I mean. The, the, now here's uh, the one thing that we haven't discussed, or maybe there's many more. I'm sure there is, but this guy is a human. He has these things. Does getting the life force, and you were saying he's sucking the life force from his sword or whatever, his energy sword. The, 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 the worm lance, ones. the worm does that. Can it, does it have to suck away all that energy before it can suck out his life? Yes, definitely. Is that what it, why he's able to withstand? I mean, he whereas could other make, humans cannot? Our guy could make a shield, our guy could make a suit of armor out of this energy or whatever to protect him. But eventually, the worm is going to be able to break that down. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But anyway, I just I like that. It doesn't have to be the way we go. Well, I mean, you have to have a reason why he doesn't just die as soon as the worm sucks at him, because the rest of the humans are just going to drop. You know. It's... Right, but he's ingested life force of others. Uh huh. So it just seems like so he has way more life. He force. has enough to uh, that it takes him a long time to suck it all free of him then that makes sense um, I mean a lot of this stuff are details that we would still have to work out but if we have the beginning the middle and the end and like the major story points that's a treatment that's what a you know a script treatment before you ever write the script for a movie is is this is the story of the movie and you know it might not have any dialogue in it it might not have specifics but you can imagine a movie from this, right? Yeah. And he, okay, so I, we basically know how he's going to destroy it at the end. I mean, now I'm, I, I don't even know who, who this guy is. If he's just an ordinary guy... Yeah, he's an ordinary maybe, guy. How? Maybe he's like 50, though. He doesn't have to be a kid. People are always young in movies, but in stories they don't have to be young. But you we know, want it to be no longer... for a movie someday. So we can get tons and tons of money out of it. <laughs> well, you just went to the new media expo. <laughs> I did. <laughs> but I, I like the idea of that he's somebody whose his relevance is over. I mean, maybe he's seventy-five. If, if in my mind, he's always been a kid. He's right. always been, you know, twenty-one yeah, I was thinking, or something yeah, like that. Young man. But and also, if, if you have a seventy-five-year-old, the romance angle is going to be much less. But you didn't want there to be a romance angle, so it's already I gone. I didn't want. No, why did I say that? A second ago, when I talked about a girl, you said you didn't want it to be zapped, and I said, "Well, yeah, but well, if I didn't want it to be zapped. That zapped is a romance. About. Zapped is a sex romp. That's different. I was saying it's all the same, though. You know what I mean? Um, it, to use your powers to impress the ladies is no different than to use your powers to see naked ladies. It's just a choice that you make on the story of whether you want to go there or not. Yeah, no, I was thinking more, is there a woman that he likes that he's interested in, that he's trying to woo, 
and now this woman is in danger because he's discovered that the entire town is going to be murdered, including, oh no, including Mabel, my love. Um, well, if she's Mabel, then he is 75. I like that. I love the idea of the, that there's some attractive woman, a retiree that lives at, that, that works at the diner or whatever, that he's just like, you know, I, if, when I was a younger man, we would have uh, had a romance together, but I'm on, you know, my life is over. I, but again, we haven't t discussed him being an old man. Just only now I just like the idea of an old man being the hero because that never happens. If he's a really old man, though, he's not very nimble and spry to be able to. But do it doesn't matter. Battle with this thing. He's he's got the life force of three people in him, which makes him 25 again. Oh, okay. Is it, you know what I mean? He's he's old, but he can pick up, you know, a an 800 pound weight and all that stuff and. Visually, I love the idea of an old, old dude being the the savior of our of our little town and all that stuff. But it's always the trope that it's a young person because that's attractive, that's romantic, that's those are our heroes, are the young, and you know, I don't know that it's important right now. I, what is important is just getting to the end of the story, right? Or well. Deciding what the main character or who the main character is makes a big difference on how the story goes, I think. What is going on with the story. Um, what, you know, the character's arc may be, what he learns from the experience, you know, what his problem is to start with and how this experience is going to improve his life or change his life when it's done. You know, that's, I think, an important part. It, it doesn't necessarily have to affect the plot, but um, I think it's still an important part of the story. Maybe we don't have to decide that today, because we're running low on time now. Almost home. Okay, but if you want to put the kibosh on the old man thing, then let's just assume that I he's a young man, and that's and that's that it saves us several steps. The more that you've talked about it, I'm, I'm actually more in. You know, I was thinking that it might, like... Your explanation of, yeah, now he's got this life force so he's energetic and he can take it on. Although, I guess he gets some life force early on by accident, so all along he can be much more spry than your average old man. Because, yeah, by accident he gets it and so he's able to fight and run from these, uh, the, the acolytes as they hunt after him and try and, and get him before he can make it to the final battle. I think that is, it's a really interesting idea, to tell you the truth, that this old man is somehow our hero, and you think, how can he be a hero? And then suddenly now he's more than just an old man. But I, I see, I also like the idea that he, he, he's no longer somebody who can make a difference, and then suddenly he can make a difference. Um, but because he's old and all that stuff, he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll sacrifice myself for Bozeman, Montana. Uh -huh. I, I, I just, I like the nobility of an old guy, um, whereas it's kind of harder for me to accept that a 22-year-old would be like, yeah, I'll fight for everybody in this town and maybe die. I'll, maybe that makes me pessimistic or, or cynical or whatever, but it, they always have to throw in the love interest and all that because, and when I say they, I say, I mean Hollywood because people in Hollywood are so arrogant and self-centered that they think that the only reason a person would do something is if their kids were in danger or their wife was in danger. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It's like, my wife is on that plane. Otherwise, I wouldn't give a crap about you terrorists. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And that's painting Hollywood in a rather broad stroke, but that I've seen it again and again and again and again. Well, it's like, well, the wife has to be in the building or his, it has to be his little girl that's under attack from the terrorists. Otherwise, why would he do it? They want to make it personal and all that stuff, and I, I am sick to death of that. We've seen it done well in Die Hard, but it, we've seen it done badly a hundred times since then. Uh-huh. Anyway, I'm sorry about that. The, 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 the man, or the young man, I guess, he... Uh, <laughs> I thought we decided it doesn't have to be a young man. I, 
I'm as into the old man idea as you now, I think. Okay, yes. well then he's a janitor or he is, is uh, he's in some menial position and he does, uh, this is the opening scene, and he does some kind of kindness, either to impress the old lady or just because he's a nice guy, he, he helps a child or whatever out that's crying to find his mom or whatever, and another child sees this and that's why he's chosen. Or he just happens to be there and the, the acolyte has no time. And so it's just luck and unfortunate that it's an old man instead of a 25-year-old bodybuilder uh -huh. that gets picked. Because a 25-year-old bodybuilder could just kick the crap out of this thing. And the acolytes could say that, you know, it's a shame that we chose you because in observing humanity, you are elderly and you are weak and you are close to death. So you are not the best choice for a champion. And he's just like, well, screw that. Right. I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll still do I'm, it. I'll win. It's like, I'm smarter than a 25-year-old bodybuilder. And I still have something to give. And all that. I don't know. Do you... I like Again, that. Scott Sigler or one of those guys who really is a writer and makes money from that would say, you don't want an old man as your thing because it's not sexy. Screw Scott, and, Scott Sigler. And, well, no, I'm not saying that Scott Sigler's a bad guy, but I'm saying <laughs> 98 out of 100 guys would say an old person is not sexy. We're not doing an old person because you're not going to sell as many tickets. Uh, but see, what's I... his name? The, the Scalzi would be one of those two from the 100. You know what I mean? Somebody that's like, you know what? Just the fact that he is an old man makes me want to read it. Yeah, it, you know, when you explained it to me, it worked for me, to tell you the truth, and I like it. I think we should go with it. Okay, so does he do a, a kindness, and the, that's why he is chosen? Or I think it does it be just be an accident? He's an the accident. only one, he's mopping the floor at the pharmacy when this alien comes by, and... That he does a kindness, I think, could be something that happens, but I don't want that to be why they choose him. Because being kind is not necessarily the thing that would help you fight an alien, uh, an alien worm. No, but it's a selfless act. And the champion of our planet would have to put a, a, away his own fear and his own selfishness. Because if you're given the powers of a minor god and you're selfish, you're just like, you'll use these for your own gain. Uh -huh. And you'll do a lot of raping. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I'm not saying that he's true, that you're wrong. Either way works. Well, then he needs to do something. I mean, kindness is one thing. Selfless is a little different. Like, you kind of have to jump in front of a car and take the impact or something like that. Or maybe that's something that it happens. Well, he's, maybe that's how he ingests he's, the dang thing. He's at... Is he's hurt, and it goes into his body, and it heals the wound. Well, I was thinking instead of that, he jumps in front of a car and pushes a child out of the way, but the car still manages to stop in time. So he isn't injured, and maybe the child wasn't, but he did that because he's selfless. It turned out that it didn't matter either way. The child would have survived, but they see that and realize that he is selfless, and, and so they... So All one of them. them comes to him that night when he's mopping the floor at the pharmacy, taps on the glass, and the old man unlocks the door and says, I'm sorry, we're closed. And the child says, you can have this if you want it. And hands him this thing and then goes away. And, and runs away. Oh, but this, but this is after he's already done the selfless thing. Yeah, I think it could be a much more, instead of later that night, just a much more immediate thing. He's going into work, and he sees a kid about to get hit in the parking lot. He runs over, pushes the kid out of the way, and the car stops just in time so that it doesn't hit either of them. And then he's like, oh, you know, and the acolyte is there, sees this happen, and then the guy goes in, and then the acolyte turns, and there's the evil acolyte behind him. And so he rushes in and follows that guy. And so as soon as the guy gets in, he puts on his vest and uh, starts filling up the mop bucket or something and heads out and then the kid comes up to him and he says oh can I help you he says 
you can have this if you want. <laughs> I like it. And uh, maybe one of his jobs is to put the salt on the, the sidewalk, you know, when it's icy. And as he's doing that, he sees a child slip and fall on the ice. And here comes a car. And so he barrels out there and hurts one of his knees or whatever, getting this kid. And the car manages to stop just fine. Uh-huh. That's a good, uh, a good scene. I like it. And then he goes in. And then later he goes in, you know, to, to jockey the mop bucket or whatever. I, he goes in to get the shovel to finish the job. And yeah, or, or and as, child as, is there. as he goes in, one of these childs does this. I, I See, I don't know, though. It, how do we convey that there's a, the, an evil acolyte that well, sees this? We don't have to convey that, per se. I mean, we just the, the, the acolyte shows up, gives it to him. And then, you know, runs, you know, moves off really quickly, disappears, and he doesn't know what's going on. And it's only later that that kind of stuff comes out. But he tucks it into his jacket or he tucks it into his apron. And, uh, yeah, he's kind of revolted because it's just some ugly thing, like a spider with a thousand legs. And uh, under what circumstance does he open it? Only when he gets a second one? Yeah, I think it has to come, yeah, once he gets a second or third one. Maybe he doesn't ever open the first one until well after he gets the second one. Maybe that first one he eventually throws away and he has to go back and get it. Like we were talking, or maybe that's not necessary. I like it, though. I like that it's way later, that he, and when his powers have all faded, that he has to go back and get that first one. Yeah, that's a good idea. But I don't know. <laughs> this is more than just a short story, though. This it's is way a, more. This yeah. is like a fifty-page thing, right? And maybe uh, not at least. But it is. It's a movie, is essentially it's what it is, because we've got a, fr- a beginning, middle, and end, and we've got a climax, and we, you know, and and I, that's fine. I like movies a lot, and I used to be a really good screenwriter, but. Well, you wanted to make this an audio drama, right? Well, no, no. I just said eventually we will do this in audio. Because the people, the four people that are listening to this will be like, wow, no, I that was really cool. I remember when they story conferenced that back in February or April of 2014, and now here it is. And I can buy it. Although I guess podcasts are free. I don't know. Well, we can make it something that they can buy as well. Okay, so not this exit, but the next one. Okay. Do you like the idea of, like, an elderly love interest? I think that could be fun. It could be cute that he, you know... I like the idea that he uses his ability to protect her. That he puts armor on her or puts her in a ball or something like that so that the worm can't get her. But that makes him vulnerable. You know what I mean? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that that is an interesting idea makes me think of something that I saw recently and I can't think was of it what Iron it was. Man 3 where he puts the armor oh, on Oh yeah, Pepper. where he puts the armor on her as the house is being destroyed. Yeah, that's That was a was. really good moment. A it movie was. I don't particularly like. I really like that moment because it's a very human side. It shows how much Tony has grown and uh, yeah, I like that. I like that idea. All right. Well, I think we're nearly out of time, so I don't know how much more we can go on about this. We'll have to save story conference number two for later, I guess. Uh, Do you think that this was a positive experience? or I mean, clearly it burned three hours of our drive, (laughs) but... I think so. I really liked how it went, and I enjoyed the idea, and I think it'll be fun to take it further and to finish it up and actually turn it into something. All right. Well, I guess we're going to call it uh, a show, and uh, the rest of the development will have to be done later. I hope the listener was able to enjoy it. I yeah, hope sorry. you, sir or ma'am, enjoyed this. I've always really enjoyed stuff like this. Sometimes they'll do it at uh, writers' conferences or, or stuff like that, and I always think that it's really cool, so hopefully... You know, you thought it was really cool too. But yeah, we're going to go ahead and call it the show and end it up here. Thanks for listening. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And uh, the, uh, the master is coming.
That's right. You can have this if you want. Oh, that's how I sound. That Gets My Goat on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them.